welcome to the first day um, of the animals in the American Popular Imagination Conference. Um, so my name is Jan and I'll be chairing today's panel on the representations of animal agency in history. And we've got three really interesting papers. Uh, before we start, I'd like to remind everyone to keep their cameras and mics off during the speakers' presentations. If you have any questions for them, please put them in the chat uh, or save them till later to ask the speakers directly as they will be taking questions then. To the speakers, please um, keep your presentation to 15 minutes um, and I'll let you know when you've got um, three minutes left with this sign. Um, and last but not least, as you see, the session will be recorded to be watched later on. So our first speaker is Todd Christopher Simmons from New York University with a presentation titled Hearing the Swiners Multitude. Over to you. Uh, thank you, good morning. Um, can everybody hear me? All right. I can hear you, but I can't see your presentation. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll bring that up in a second. Oh, I just okay, wanna yeah, make sure okay. everybody could hear me. Cool. Yeah. Um, also, uh, is uh, I'll bring up that presentation. Um, and I just wanna make sure that everybody can uh, oops, I'm sorry. You'd think that after so many years in Zoom, I would have this down. But, um, can everybody see that? Sharing the Swinish multitude. Great. Um, and, and, and everybody can see the images. All right. Perfect. Um, so uh, I'm going to open with a poem. It uh, talks about the uses of pigs. So if anybody's a little bit squeamish, I'll just uh, wave or indicate uh, when when the poem's done. But um, it's written by Jim Carruth, uh, and it's called Uses from Black Heart. And what he writes is, a butcher in the back garden, finishing off his beer, um, sorry, of boasts of wars fought before slitting the throat of our old boar. Blood gush gushing into a pail below blue skies, useful animal, the pig. It gives us thick cut ham, succulent sausages, rashers of bacon, his words sizzle in the heat. Blood for black pudding, bristles for brushes, leathers for saddles and footballs and bags. Yes, you can find a use for every part of the pig except the squeal. After the bleeding, the scaldering, the butchering, it's the squeal that stays, piercing my summers. So what I'm looking at is hearing the swinish multitude, but also hearing the voices of pigs. Um, it's a story that's set in a very specific time and place, but it's one that's been looked at in multiple cities. It's uh, early 19th century New York City. Um, there were pigs everywhere. Uh, and it's, this is a painting right here that I have. The first image is of five points in New York City. Um, this is the original. Um, it's a very, I, I hope you can all see it. It's a very quiet painting. If you look around the image, you don't see anybody really speaking, really screaming. Everybody's kind of got their mouths closed. You see uh, two pigs, one off to the left and one kind of central to the painting. Um, and they're both quiet. Uh, but what happened was once this painting was done in 1827, a second image was done. And that's this. Um, there the pig in the center is being, uh, has its tail being pulled, people's mouths are open, they're screaming, they're talking, they're yelling. Uh, the pig on the other side is kind of rooting in uh, the muck and the mire. And that's what Five Points was like. Not so much the original painting, which was by George Ketlin, um, who was famous for uh, a lot of his portrayals of the Native Americans in the West. This one, the copy, is more like what Five Points would have been like. Um, a situation with pigs, and it's kind of a an unusual story because you don't think of pigs uh, being so prolific in New York City is uh, that they were there since the original Dutch uh, colony was founded. Uh, they were causing problems then. Wall Street was a wall. Uh, they were digging up the wall um, and damaging property throughout the city. By the 1800s, uh, it had gotten worse. Uh, there were more pigs than ever. Uh, so many, in fact, that uh, in 1809, nose ring laws were passed so that pigs could stop rooting up the streets. They were tearing up the streets, making uh, the, the roads impassable. They were, uh, as you see in the painting here, uh, the woman in the center, they were uh, attacking people. Um, and so this was all kind of the setting of the city that was expanding at a remarkable rate uh, that really wanted to compete on the world stage. And you had a problem with pigs. It wasn't unusual to New York, uh, London had, dealt with their pig problem 
earlier. Uh, Dublin was actually still in the midst of trying to figure out what to do with the pigs that were in the city. Um, but New York kind of was a special case because uh, when you're looking at the early 1800s, you're looking at post-revolution, but not too far after the American Revolution, when people were still trying to decide who the revolution actually served, who was benefiting uh, from this, this war. Uh, a lot of the people that you would see in this painting that would have been living in Five Points were veterans um, of that war. So this is a very loud painting uh, as opposed to the previous one, which is a very quiet painting. Um, and so it's kind of interesting the paintings speak. As the uh, poet wrote, um, it's the voice that pierces his summers. So you have the pig laws beginning in 1809, but what starts to happen is um, they, the city wants to get rid of all the pigs. So by 1816, they pass laws to say, okay, no more free ro roaming pigs on the street. They have to be uh, kept in uh, styes. It has to stop. Um, and it was uh, an African-American chimney sweep named Adam Marshall who started the first petitions to keep pigs in the street, um, to allow this free roaming uh, event to happen. And so he was uh, ahead of the chimney sweep union. And it's interesting that he fought for pigs, but fought against street criers because it was a very loud city. Um, so what you have happening is you have the voice of the pigs and you have the voice of the of the people who in politics at that point were kind of peripheral to everything everything was still kind of as i said that finding of where the american revolution served um everybody had a voice and it was interesting that at that time um, petitions um, vote it was all wide open in new york it wasn't until 1821 that that was all kind of tied to an end um, so the swinish multitude, uh, Edmund Burke's uh, phrase of, of kind of the, this class, these people um, lived in five points. And five points uh, on this map, you can vaguely see it, but here you kind of, it's, it was kind of an asterisk to history. Um, there was that movie uh, that was done, The Gangs of New York, uh, which of course looked at the Five Point uh, region. Um, but it wasn't really a focus of what was happening moving forward. It was kind of keeping the city in the back. Um, and so as the pigs issue uh, rises and gets more firmly established, and as petitions come up to keep the pigs free running um, in 1817, uh, a letter writer, an editorial writer, writes a poem to the uh, New York Evening Post. And the New York Evening Post at that point was a very free paper as far as opinions went and really covered both sides of every story. Uh, but the poem goes, some years ago, we all do know, our fathers thought it rude that someone said that they'd obeyed the swinish multitude. But now the hogs, those grunting dogs, a voice they have in council grave and rule in every street, you two-legged crowd come grunt more loud and break the demon yoke. So that's at the beginning of 1818. And 1818 is kind of an interesting year because 1818 is when um, the major push to eliminate hogs uh, from the street occurs. Uh, it's not the only time that animals are kind of brought up in court proceedings. Uh, there was the whale oil trial of Maurice versus Judge earlier that year, um, which was to designate whether whales were mammals or fish. Um, but what happens is in 1818, something that um, the book Frankenstein is published. And Frankenstein has an indirect tie to what I'm talking about here. Frankenstein uh, is ostensibly the creation of a life from the parts of others. And one of the issues uh, in animal history is the creation of lives from other lives the, to create an animal that has agency, that has um, a central role in history. Uh, and Frankenstein is interesting because it's the voice that we hear of uh, the monster that's eloquent in a way at the end. Um, and it's finding the voice of the pigs, of the animals in history 
uh, that becomes important to creating uh, accurate and rigorous animal histories. Um, Martha Hodes, who's a historian, uh, was asking how we shape histories of the voiceless. Uh, she writes in an article, no good historian should take a stand against the recovery of voices that are already submerged in the archives. These voices, fleeting, fragmentary, cursory, dictated, transcribed, mediated, and ventriloquized are critical for the recovery of what would otherwise be lost entirely. We must keep searching for unheard voices, and when we find them, we must listen hard. Um, she notes that we should be unafraid to take leaps of grounded imagination in our invocations and interpretations. Um, one thing that is uh, necessary to proceed with caution in the field of animal studies and animal histories is not to make comparisons um, that are inappropriate with uh, humans um, in terms of, uh, and, and it happens a lot of slavery or the Holocaust. But I think what she's pointing out here is that finding these voices is important. And that's what I've been trying to do with the work that I'm looking at here. Um, in December of 1818, the city's had enough. Uh, they try a, a Christian Harriet, who's a butcher for having free running pigs. Um, early 1819, the trial goes to court and Harriet, of course, loses. Uh, he's defended by some of the biggest names and brightest names uh, in the legal profession at that time. The uh, sitting judge is the mayor of the city and pigs are supposedly eliminated from the streets. You can no longer have free roaming pigs. Uh, what happens instead of the elimination of pigs is that suddenly everybody gets one. Five points, uh, sits at a place that because of the population living there um, becomes like an enclave, becomes an island on the city of the island because of the pigs. The pigs tear up the streets. You're either forced to drive through slowly in a carriage or on a horse so that you're not thrown um, or you avoid the area altogether. So this island of kind of revolt starts within the center of the city. Um, so we move forward into the 1820s when revolution really starts to happen. Um, the city is throwing the removal of the pigs around to different organizations, uh, to the almshouses and threatening their charters, um, to a kind of vague police force. Um, nobody's able to control the problem. They send out something called hog carts, which they compare to the carts in the uh, French Revolution. And Guards take the pigs, put them in the hog carts, and a crowd of people, they allow the pigs to be collected. A crowd of people, though, is waiting at the end of the street, and they beat up the hog cart uh, driver. They release all the pigs, and everything just kind of goes back to the way it was. Um, in 1825, uh, one of the comments is a riot took place yesterday at the intersection of First Avenue and North Street. A number of persons in opposition to laws of corporation relative to the collection of hogs running at large in the streets gathered around the hog cart increased to several hundred from menace and derision. They were not long in proceeding to acts of violence. The hog cart was overturned. One or two of the officers in attendance were seriously injured. Um, it becomes a revolution within the city. Um, newspaper articles are written touting the hogs, saying the voice that we heard about in that one poem uh, that's being heard in council is actually getting louder than ever. Um, the pigs are compared to the spirit of independence. It's kind of an odd, um, when you think of, you know, the don't tread on me snake or, or the American eagle, the pig is kind of a strange yet compelling um, symbol of what's going on with this new revolution. Um, the problem doesn't go away. In fact, it just keeps getting worse. Um, Charles Dickens comes to the city in the 1840s. Um, and it's interesting that there's kind of a, a, a reassessment of Charles Dickens and the social reformers that it's going on now. Um, and these people were happy with what was going on. Dickens writes, 
Um, they are the city scavengers, these pigs, ugly brutes they are, having for the most part scanty brown backs like the lids of old horsehair trunks spotted with unwholesome black blotches. They have gaunt legs too and such peaked snouts that if one could be persuaded to sit for a profile, nobody would recognize it for a pig's likeness. Um, he goes on to say that in the five point regions, uh, the pigs must be asking themselves why people are walking up and not on two legs and not grunting like hogs. The voice starts to come through. Everybody starts to pick up on uh, what the pigs are saying uh, in the parade. Uh, just before July 4th, 1825, uh, the pigs are collected and the article says that they're squealing and talking to their owners as much as they are to each other uh, and asking to be free. So the pig's voice, um, here's a, an 1833, uh, Dublin broadside, looking at the swinish multitude. Uh, as humans and pigs are conflated, um, pigs are conflated with prostitution. Um, these are some images of pigs, the kind of ugly pigs that uh, Charles Dickens look at. These are from those images. There's the American notes that he publishes in the United States. And people take offense to this being um, brought out so much. Uh, this is a uh, an image called the Night Sawyer from the, or Sawyer from the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I've highlighted the pigs on the one side of it um, and the African-American who's sawing the wood, uh, disenfranchised voices that uh, really became part of um, the revolution and finding a new way forward. This is a, a butcher from that uh, era. But, it's the voice that starts to come through. If we look for the voice, uh, these newspapers, uh, particularly the, the New York Evening Post, really showed what the voice is like uh, and brought that voice to the fore. And so that's uh, what I've been working on here. Uh, I hope I'm not running over on time. That's a problem. No, thank you very much for your in you. interesting presentation. Um, brilliant. Um, so our second speaker is Philip James Grider from the University of Gottingen with a paper called The Raccoon as Agent of Colonialism in Early North America. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can manage to share my screen because I have to <laughs> struggle with that. Um, while I'm doing that, I just want to preface by saying that this is very much a work in progress uh, and it's supposed to be part of my, um, my PhD project. It's a small part of one of the sections in my PhD project. So um, a, a lot might be changed. It's not finished. So, okay. Uh, can you all see my screen? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so in 1612, Captain John Smith makes the first mention in literature of a raucon. Uh, and that's the animal we know today as the raccoon. Uh, Smith's description of the raccoon in a map of Virginia is brief, and it claims that, a uh, quote, uh, let's see how this, uh, there's a beast they call a raucon, much like a badger, but used to live on trees as squirrels do. And this comparison between raccoons and badgers is echoed by William Wood in 1634 with the addition of attributes of foxes and even lambs. Um, so I'll read the quote, the raccoon is a deep furred beast, not much unlike a badger, having a tail like a fox, as good meat as a lamb. There's one of them in the tower. These beasts in the daytime sleep in hollow trees. In the moonshine night, they go to feed on clams at a low tide by the seaside where the English hunt them with their dogs. Uh, in a gesture of what Hayden White deems, uh, quote, familiarizing the unfamiliar, uh, Smith and Wood compare the unknown raccoon to animals they know from their native Britain. The they that Smith refers to in the quote um, as knowing the Araucan points toward the Powhatan people. Uh, Smith was famously in contact with a Powhatan woman named Matuaka, known to almost everyone today as Pocahontas. And it is this contact, presumably, that informed Smith of the animal's name, uh, which would in turn develop into today's raccoon. And as Daniel Heath Justice notes, uh, the name raccoon, which we know and use today, is the, uh, quote, English corruption of a geographically narrow and culturally specific term, and comes from the Algonquin Powhatan um, Aracunum, which means one who scratches with its hands. And this corruption would develop into raccoon in William Wood's New England prospect 20-odd uh, years later. Uh, sorry. 
20 odd years later in 1634. Um, the raccoon was actually known under a different name to a number of Algonquian people across the North American continent, and that is uh, Esteban, and that means one who picks up things. Uh, the etymology of the word we use today to describe the raccoon is relevant when thinking about the raccoon as an agent of colonialism. Uh, the fact that the word raccoon can be traced back to a culturally specific term used by specific people in a specific region of North America is clear indication of the British colonial um, project in North America. And this is specifically the, the settling of the Northeast. Um, Smith and his company came into contact with the Powhatan Algonquin people and ultimately fought the first Anglo-Powhatan War against them uh, between 1609 and 1614 in the Northeast. So this is this, this uh, uh, the etymology of the word signals toward the, um, the settling of the Northeast. Uh, Danny Heath Justice observes that, uh, quote, it is colonialism that brought raccoon into English. The reason the etymology of raccoon is highlighted is that it's an indication of colonial naming and claiming practices. And um, the animal has a number of names within the Algonquin language, as uh, you see on, the, on my slide. Um, however, it's Smith's colonial contact with the Powhatan people and his ability and power of being able to publish an account of this contact that would inform not only him, but his readership and subsequent naturalists, and of course, um, in the end, us today also of the name raccoon. As such, uh, Smith, as a personification in this case of the colonial project in North America, is in the position of power to uh, quote unquote name uh, the animal um, definitely. And so in doing that, he erases the indigenous cultural heritage that's inherent in the animal's multitude of um, descriptive names that it had before. Uh, the raccoon and its depiction across different texts of early America serves, I, I would posit, as a fruitful example of the broader discussion of non-human agency. So that means animal agency, but also that can be a landscape agency, a agency of artifacts. But in this case, um, the raccoon is, a, is an example of how that would work. Um, and it's enough, I would say, to return to the etymology of the raccoon's name at first to understand why this is the case. So what both of the above uh, discussed etymologies have in common is an underlying notion of agency. Um, the animal's name used by indigenous peoples refers to specific things that it's capable of doing and that it does often. And these are, of course, they're akin to, to, human, to human action and echo human-like traits. And I, I realize that this is a very simplistic way of thinking about agency, of doing this you know, by proxy of the, the human traits that the animal has, but that's how these texts um, work in this case. But it's a, it's a very simple argument to make, I would say. So um, the traits are picking up things with their hands or scratching with their hands. And I would say the fact that they even are described as having hands and not paws is significant in this case. So as such, the raccoon and um, its human-like descriptions is ascribed agency by proxy of the, of the human and the etymology of its name. Um, 100 years later, so this is 1714 now, John Lawson describes the raccoon in his History of Carolina in the following terms. And I... Quote, um, if taken young, the raccoon is easily made tame, but is the drunkenest creature ever living, if he can get any liquor that is sweet and strong. They're rather more unlucky than a monkey. When wild, they're very subtle in catching their prey. Those that live in the salt water feed much on oysters, which they love. The way that this animal catches crabs, which he greatly admires, and which are plenty in Carolina, is worthy of remark. When he intends to make uh, a prey of these fish, he goes to a marsh where standing on the land, he lets his tail hang in the water. This the crab takes for bait and fastens his claws therein, which as soon as the raccoon perceives, he of a sudden springs forward a considerable way on the land and brings the crab along with him. The fur makes good hats and linings, the skin dress makes fine women's shoes. And so the way that Lawson describes the raccoon throughout this excerpt is odd, I would say. Um, the text describes agency to the raccoon in a couple of ways. So uh, for one, Lawson attributes the raccoon human-like features, most notably the consideration that it is uh, the drunkenest creature ever living and the idea of it being unlucky or even being able, um, capable of admiring, loving, or intending anything at all. Um, so the word choice is interesting. 
And though Lawson, of course, acknowledges the raccoon's animality, um, interestingly, he continuously also uses the, um, the masculine second person pronoun he instead of it when he refers to the raccoon. And it would commonly be the case for animals to use it. Um, so even though this is all happening, as I've mentioned, on a kind of superficial level, uh, the raccoon is anthropomorphized and ascribed to agency through its supposed proximity to the human. Um, so it's also important to consider the genre of these texts. They're natural histories and travel accounts. They're written by um, Anglo-European settlers, colonizers to North America, and their purpose is to present a very distinctive perspective on the North American landscape and its wildlife in the context, of course, of the colonial project um, that their authors are a part of. So Smith's account refers specifically to Virginia, Woods refers to New England, and Lawson's refers to Carolina, and those are all early colonial settlements in North America, or what would become North America, yeah. Uh, the authors and other famous commentators of the Colonial Project painted a picture of, uh, quote, an unmarked empty new world wilderness with its multitude of wild creatures, which was often used as an incentive to occupy the land. Um, so um, the addition of the uses of the animal's fur seems out of place in Lawson's description, um, and the passage ends rather abruptly with the estimation that, quote, the fur makes good hats and linings, and the skin dress makes fine women's shoes. If we consider, however, the colonial context, it makes much greater sense to add this information into what otherwise seems like a depiction of an intelligent and, as mentioned before, human-like creature. The mention of raccoon fur at the end of the quoted paragraph also situates it within a colonial economic discourse rather than a simply naturalist discourse at first sight, a uh, descriptive discourse. So, in a sense, Lawson presupposes the raccoon's role in the American fur trade of the late 18th to 19th centuries, and uh, meaning uh, the beaver wars. Um, and it, it may seem counterintuitive to conclude that the hunted and dead animal exerts agency as a, as a fur or as a pelt. Um, but even though the, the animal is no longer alive itself, I would say that the artifacts made from its body are in a sense alive. Uh, in the way that they um, in the way that they they can change their surroundings and what they stand for. So Daniel Heath Justice traces the raccoon's uh, significance in the fur trade and in particular its prominence on the frontier. And this is where the the raccoon becomes the agent of colonialism really. Uh, so Justice says that the raccoon's fur became a symbol of rebel patriotism rooted in an untamed and untamable land. Um, and it's the, um, the, 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 the raccoon and the beaver, because if we're thinking about the beaver wars and the beaver's prominence as a, as a fur-bearing animal, the, the raccoon is, stands for this, um, the frontier, the frontier narrative, Davy Crockett wears a, a coonskin cap, and beavers are associated with the upper class um, and um, the British elite, more or less. So if we see there's the hats that are beaver hats or military hats, um, high-ranking military and the civilian hats are upper-class hats, while Davy Crockett is the one who's associated with the frontier with his coonskin uh, cap. And I'm, I'm ending, I'm ending in, a, in two minutes, I, I promise, I'm sorry. Um, so Having this, having this coonskin cap and the raccoon associated with the with the frontier and this rebel, uh, this rebel narrative, um, the rough lifestyle also uh, associates it with a wild life, a wild, uh, wild nature, um, which is the opposite of civilization, the opposite of, uh, um, yeah, I guess civilizedness in quotes, and also situ situates it with um, narratives of the noble savage the um, the natives living in this untamable land, supposedly untamed land. And with that, the raccoon and all the things made from its pelt and what the raccoon stands for, making the raccoon an agent of colonialism is that for one, as we see with the hats, the raccoon stands for the national discourse of class in America, in early America, and also becomes a symbol of a uh, colonialist, racializing, othering of uh, Native Americans that live in this land that's being 
uh, settled in the westward expansion of the frontier. So the raccoon stands for hegemonic colonial narratives of wildness, roughness, uncivilizedness, um, and thus is, as I, I would say right now, uh, at this state of my research, uh, an agent of colonialism. And th thanks. I'm sorry for going longer. That's all right. Um, thank you very much. That was very fascinating. Thank you. Um, so we moving on to um, our last speaker, um, Brian Leach from Augustana College uh, with a presentation titled Canary in the Cold Mine from Mind Safety Technique to Animal Metaphor. Over to you. Great. Can everyone see my, uh, my presentation? Great. All right. Um, well, let me just uh, begin uh, quickly with just noting that um, Lots of scholars have, have kind of discussed, especially the, the mining industry's um, appearance, you know, uh, uh, people worried about um, how mining has, you know, uh, maimed bodies, um, scared of, of kind of peripheral geographies that, that house these people. Um, indeed, you know, everyone who's, who's even been allured by the underground believes that it, it is extremely dangerous uh, throughout popular culture. And that, of course, that cultural perception has its roots in reality. Um, the mining industry is a long endangered people who traveled underground. Um, this presentation is going to concern uh, one of miners' safety practices, uh, which involved the use of animals, particularly birds, as a form of technology to detect the presence, especially of carbon monoxide, but of other gases too. Uh, this practice ended by the middle of the 20th century, but since that time, it's taken on an extended life as a metaphor. Uh, the phrase, a canary in a coal mine, uh, continues as a common idiom to explain an impending disaster in politics, the market, the environment, you name it. Uh, that continued use has encouraged the inclusion of birds uh, and other small animals as a plot device in television and movies. When creators want to suggest some sort of increased and often invisible risk uh, facing the characters. Uh, as both a mining practice and especially as a continued trope, therefore, I, I'm arguing the canary in a coal mine will allow this presentation to go beyond people's typical reflex to treat nature and technology as, as mutually exclusive, um, as Alandra uh, Chang puts it in the, the book Playing Nature. Instead, the canary trope turns the animal into a technology. Um, the results of this approach are you know, numerous, but I'm going to focus on, on two of them. Um, first, that the canary metaphor keeps this popular perception of the mining industry stuck in a dangerous past. And second, the metaphor maintains a view of animals as technological tools for the sake of people, um, encouraging uh, Americans' continued anthropocentrism. Now, let's start with some historical practice to give us some background. Uh, miners, of course, long played, paid close attention to their underground environment to detect possible dangers. Um, interviews from miners um, recount sounds like creaking and cracking, unusual smells, sudden vibrations as all being useful to help them kind of understand when and where to expect hazards. But of course, most of the dangers specific to 19th century coal mining had to do with air. Uh, miners labeled the buildup of gases as various damps. Um, fire damp was particularly ominous. It was the gaseous smell when mining released pockets of methane. And fire damp plus coal dust in the air, right, could cause an explosion. Um, and often miners used open flames. Underground air could also cause asphyxiation. Um, air often contained too little oxygen, too much carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, or carbon monoxide, which we still know to be colorless, odorless, tasteless, and of course, extremely deadly. Um, in short, detecting problems in mine air was both incredibly difficult and vital. Um, mines tried sending a single person down below at first, like they'd cover themselves up with a wet blanket and hold a flame, um, hoping that that one person could serve as kind of an early warning for methane. A more common and humane method was to just use the flames that miners carried. Low flame meant little oxygen. A big flame could mean methane. Unfortunately, like flame is an imperfect tool. It could cause a fire itself, right, if you bring it into a, a room full of methane. Um, so in the early 20th century, it, it became common practice to use small, warm-blooded mammals um, and various other kinds of animals as detect detection devices. Scientists have more recently labeled these small animals sentinel species, 
Um, as described in the journal Environmental Health Perspective, sentinel species are organisms in which changes in known characteristics can be measured to assess the extent of environmental contamination and its implications for human health. At the time, though, uh, miners just thought of them as simply improved safety technology. Uh, most historical writing credits Scottish uh, physiologist John Scott Haldane for the techniques introduction in British coal mines. Um, 1895, he, he essentially discovered that it was carbon monoxide that was the uh, a, a deadly element in mines, and he suggested that small warm-blooded animals could serve as an early warning. Um, although many writers suggest that he is responsible for the use of canaries, he actually originally just suggested that you'd pay attention to and bring down a mouse. Um, it's clear, however, that birds, especially canaries, quickly came into common usage in Britain, though, maybe perhaps because they were easy to get at pet stores. Uh, 1906, uh, uh, Nottingham Evening, Evening Post article noted the new use. Um, a 1911 article in Scotland labels them a scientific adjunct to coal mining. Um, why? I mean, canaries had a rapid breathing rate. They take in air in both inspiration and expiration. They have a high metabolism, and their small size makes them more likely to either get agitated, depressed, or otherwise distressed given a small amount of poisonous gas. By 1911, Britain required two small caged birds to be brought down into a coal mine in each shift. Canaries continued to be used in Britain until they started being phased out in the 1980s. American mines made use of small animals too. Um, uh, historian Thomas Andrews has found that they were used uh, in the US state of Colorado. Although often they used mice at first um, and not even mice that they brought down. They were just mice that kind of followed uh, mine mules and their feed down there. But the miners loved them. They enjoyed the distraction. They would give mice their, their food, <laughs> um, give them names. And they liked the fact that the mice were not just sensitive to air, but also to noise, right? So if they heard timbers cracking or possible rocks falling, they would um, scatter. Um, so. In other words, uh, despite this example, the whole canaries became kind of the sentinel of choice um, in the US as well. Uh, that dominance came partly because the mining industry had globalized. It meant that that scientific and technological knowledge quickly traveled across the ocean from Britain. Um, the earliest reference I've found is from 1911 uh, to them being used. Um, despite kind of an initial debate over whether or not they'd work, writing at the time suggests uh, that they had been used for, for a while. They became kind of part of this broader safety first agenda across the mining industry, um, partly uh, promoted by the US's new um, Bureau of Mines, which was founded in 1910 um, to essentially <laughs> by coal mine operators really to try and sidestep more intrusive local legislation. Um, one of the Bureau's first major studies published in 1914 investigated the use of all sorts of small warm blooded animals. Um, they recommended mice and especially canaries uh, Canaries came out on top, uh, on top as much due to their demeanor and their reliability as their sensitivity. Um, they claimed that mice could be sulky, uh, sitting quietly upon their arrival underground, even when they were perfectly healthy. Um, while mice suffered from sulkiness, the canary remained cheerful and active, um, and so they thought that this would work better. Um, plus, it always recovered if it was quickly removed from carbon monoxide, and so the recovery teams um, from any mine rescue could use a canary again and again. Um, without any danger of the canary becoming less sensitive. So its health was therefore not Im important, not just because people cared about the, the canary itself, right, but because the bird could continue its use as a tool. Um, rescue teams would know when to pull out a breathing apparatus, for instance. Um, none other than the Scottish Dr. Haldane uh, invented a tight portable glass and metal cage fed by oxygen to try and use to revive canaries for this purpose, um, although it was never apparently generally accepted. Um, it is true, though, that, that often miners cared some, a fair amount about the welfare of birds. Certainly news articles suggest this, um, that miners sometimes would bring them home as pets. Uh, you can, there's a 1917 article I found from the, uh, reporting that the American Mining Congress in Chicago had you know, feeded one bird for saving a bunch of their lives. Um, so the interesting part to me is that Americans soured on canaries sooner than, than Brit it, Britain. Um, by 1921, the US Bureau of Mines had reported that the Department of Chemical Warfare had created a more simple actual technological device to instantaneously determine the presence of carbon monoxide, used iodine pentoxide, and it would show a green color whenever that gas was present. And it was also super portable um, and would detect gas sooner than a canary. By 1931, it was no longer the official test for carbon monoxide in the US. Um, 
they did a fairly good job at their at their role, but were certainly um, not as good as this new detection. And uh, they saw some use beyond the 1930s, but they gradually disappeared from um, official protocols. Okay, the strangest part of the story for me is that canary, just as canaries were kind of on their way out as a, as a safety technology, they emerged as this powerful metaphor. The meaning of the, of the metaphor is simple, right? The thing being discussed is an early warning of a bigger danger. Um, its earliest uses came in the 19-teens and 20s on the adult education circuit known as Chautauqua. Um, and afterwards, it very slowly appears in books. Um, 1940s references to endangered trout streams, use of charts and quality control, alertness of female secretaries and notifying businessmen of financial dangers. Um, by the 1950s, the metaphor had made its way into foreign relations chatter, investment tips, considerations of, of virus susceptibility. And you can see, though, that the, the term didn't really become widespread, though, until the 1980s and 90s. Um, when I did searches through the New York Times and Chicago Tribune, it's a similar slope. Um, Chicago's newspaper holds only one record of the phrase being used in 1969 by author Kurt Vonnegut, uh, nonetheless, followed by a few mentions in 1976. But the rest of those results happened after the 1980s. Search in the New York Times uh, shows the phrase first appearing outside of the context of mining in the 1980s. Uh, and most of the occurrences have occurred in the, in the last 20 years. In other words, the fewer actual canaries being brought into coal mines in the English-speaking world, the more people talked about them. Um, obviously, it was a really flexible metaphor. It could be used for many situations. In fact, climate activists in the 20-teens began to speak about climate canaries without even mentioning the coal mine as a way to discuss you know, natural phenomena that would signal climate danger for humans. Popularity of the metaphor amongst writers and journalists brought the canary out of the coal mine and into a broader American popular culture. In many instances, the use of the trope comes within an underground context. Um, here, it was a brief gag in the 1992 third season episode of The Simpsons titled Radio Bart. In the episode, the townsfolk are trying to rescue Bart, who was, of course, fell down a well. They're trying to dig a tunnel and they encounter a dead canary. A character yells gas, they evacuate, but then Dr. Hebert performs an autopsy on the bird and declares it died of natural causes. And so the townsfolk all head back in the hole. It's notable the musical guest in that episode is the singer Sting, uh, whose 1980s song with his band, The Police, may be the most famous use of the metaphor. Titled Canary in a Coal Mine, the song compares the subject's ability to be overcome by paranoia um, to a canary being overcome with gas. Given the fact that the metaphor took off in usage starting in 1980, it's possible the police may have encouraged this trend. There is one common way the trope gets deployed that merits further examination. Uh, films use the trope when they need to represent the most frightening and unknown dangers possible, whether a disease pandemic, surprising monsters, or even aliens from space. Um, one good example is the science fiction movie uh, Arrival, in which a linguist and a physicist become the go-betweens between, between humans on Earth and an alien spaceship hovering above the US state of Montana. When the two humans enter the alien craft, they bring along a canary likely for the same reason you bring one underground to test the air inside the alien capsule. Um, another genre replete in ominous warnings, uh, horror movies provide prominent examples too. Take the, the Alfred Hitchcock horror film, The Birds from 1963. The antagonists in the movie are normal birds, but for unexplained reasons, they begin to attack humans. The movie opens with two protagonists meeting at a pet shop where the woman purchases two lovebirds for the man's 11-year-old sister. When wild, violent birds outside come near, the two calm lovebirds become anxious and noisy, right? In other words, they serve as, a, as an early warning of an attack. Um, unlike those crazed wild birds, they never show signs of violence, and hence they're rescued by the protagonist at the end of the film. A more recent horror uh, movie, uh, Netflix's 2018 film Bird Box, similarly uses the uh, titular birds as an early warning signal of a surprising unseen horror. In the movie, invisible antagonists roam the outdoors. If a person looks at them, they immediately uh, commit suicide. The trick to staying alive then is to either stay inside or if forced to head out to wear a mask over your eyes. The film's hero, Mallory, played by Sandra Bullock, uh, spends much of the film trying to save herself and her two children. She leads them on a dangerous boat trip downstream to safety while they all wear blindfolds. Um, although the movie never leads its characters underground, it spends much of the time showing viewers this kind of darkness that its characters have to live in as they try to navigate the world blindfolded. In some ways, the birds serve as the character's kind of assistive technology, helping them manage the disability they're experiencing in a world dominated by this unseen force. Mallory finds these small birds early um, in a cage. She learns the birds provide an early warning that the ominous presence has arrived. 
on her later trip with the two children then, she puts the birds into a box um, and brings them on the boat. The birds provide important warnings throughout the film. They're seen as so important that when the boat tips over at one point, we see Mallory immediately check to make sure the birds are still in the box. Um, indeed, it's the unseen hidden element of their dangers that connects these movies to the real life use of canaries. Um, the filmmakers seem to be asking, hey, if birds worked as an early warning sign for something colorless and odorless like carbon monoxide, then why not for mysterious dangers related to the supernatural or outer space? By including birds, filmmakers ask audience to equate the dangers in minds with the scariest, most inexplicable horrors people could think of. In some ways, movies like Bird Box, therefore, fit rather well with the many horror movies that are actually set underground. There's lots of movies since the 1970s that feature abandoned mines, for instance. They help to maintain our negative impression of mines and mining. Mines must be horrible places if they're similar to the Bird Box's monstrous landscape. Hence, even though the movies are only kind of including canaries as a wave towards mining, they likely reinforce a continued long-standing stigma for mines in their towns. If the first thing people think of when they hear mining is a canary, then mining also feels more ancient, right? Part of an earlier era when we didn't have fancy technology. Um, domesticated birds and the birds, bird box and arrival also again, go against this kind of common technological optimism often expressed in American movies. In a crisis, it's only old fashioned birds that remain the best warning system. Um, perhaps uh, the best, uh, uh, maybe more important to note, is the role of the birds themselves in the stories, right? The canaries become more a metaphor than a living animal, valued more for its ability to serve humans than for its itself. Um, the movies I mentioned above, uh, you know, showed humans expressing some affection for the birds. You see Mallory talking to the softly and Bird Box, for instance. Um, but the birds are also clearly represented more as tools than as living beings or as beloved pets even. The, tech, the characters show even less love for their birds than the miners did for their sentinels. Um, birds in the movies are cheerful, but they don't seem to be otherwise involved in the stories. They're more technology than the animal, a tool, not a creature. Um, hence, they encourage Americans' anthropocentrism. Uh, the birds may be incredible out of this world tools, right? But they're still just that, tools. Um, so, I, you know, I'll conclude just say it's, it's tough to know if we ever see this metaphor break out of its, uh, I don't know, bird box or bird cage. <laughs> Um, but hopefully others can and will provide um, our feathered friends with, with some sort of uh, more avian agency. And otherwise, thanks very much. Thank you for your um, very informative presentation. So we're now moving on to the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions for the speakers, please type, um, type them in the chat or um, you can Raise your hand and I'll um, call your name and then um, you can ask the questions. And you also lovely for other speakers to turn on their camera as well, you don't mind. Mm. I do have a lot of questions for the speakers, so um, I'm actually break the eyes by um, starting with mine first. Um, so I have a um, question first for Philip. Um, yeah, it was really interesting, well, um, your presentation. Um, so when you talked about all these indigenous sort of names of the raccoons, uh, it reminded me of Kimaro's, um, the idea of language of animacy. Um, so I don't know whether you plan to or do you have um, addressed that in your research um, and I'm also curious about your your stance on the, the term anthropomorphism so obviously you know it, it's very kind of a kind of contested term in the environmental humanities you know often people say you're just projecting your, your human attributes onto animals um, so therefore it's anthropocentric but do you also see some values in that term as well um, in consideration of uh, you know the indigenous ways of using or naming animals yeah, thank you. Those are uh, difficult to answer. So I um, have not actually thought about Kimmerer and uh, her notions of animals and agency. I've um, I've been reading Kimmerer for the um, for uh, her use of plants and what what role plants play because uh, a big a major part of my my dissertation is also focused on landscape agency. So I'm thinking about landscape agency, botanical agency, 
And that's that's where I've looked at Kimmerer, but not uh, in terms of animals. So that's a great, thanks. Um, and anthropomorphism, I have to admit, I haven't thought about the term. Um, I haven't thought deeply about the term and um, how it could be problematic. But of course, I mean, I think I kind of kind of addressed it when I was when I was criticizing myself while I was speaking. So I think. I think it's very simplistic to use um, to use human traits and think about that, in, especially in the context of um, agency, and especially if we're thinking about um, also indigenous notions of uh, what animals um, are and what role they play, and I guess also naming because they're not actually named, right? They're they're their own beings who uh, inherently have names because because they're this, themselves. So. I think I don't really have a, a good satisfying answer, um, but I can thank you for giving me a good thing to think about when I'm when I continue writing because I'll have to consider that. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, thank you for the response anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so before you know to continue with my questions, uh, we do have a question from the audience uh, from Denise um, to Todd who. So she, oh, sorry, they ask uh, who was the person you referenced in regards to recovering lost voices. Uh, then I put in the chat. Martha Hodes uh, was is a historian who um, was was looking at uh, the recovery of lost voices in history and finding uh, the, the unspoken voices in the archive. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I might just um, sort of not build on, but continue with Todd um, with my questions as well. Um, so on the painting, you know, even the original and the copy of uh, the fine points, um, there's this portrayal of, um, and you sort of the map that you, you pulled up as well, um, this idea of, you know, that the, the fine points, the conversion of like five different avenues or roads or whatever. And that sort of reminded me of kind of the idea of, you know, the, the, the convergence between humans and humans or the entanglement. And in, with that um, with that relation to, you know, this idea of swine multitude, I don't know whether you sort of um, address that as well in your research, or can you comment a bit more on that kind of, you know, this idea of, of, of a thing colliding and, and emitting each other at a point? Yeah, um, Five Points was a very interesting neighborhood. When the city was planned, it was planned, you know, mainly northeast or north, south, east, west. Um, Broadway was an old Native American trail uh, that was uh, used and then developed into what we know as Broadway in New York City right now. Um, so the, the city was planned in kind of this grid and five points became, like I said, an asterisk. It kind of became like this weird um, five points is, is gone now. Uh, uh, the city's changed to more of that grid. So it runs. But five points was... Um, I think that it became easy for uh, Five Points to become an island enclave because of that kind of strange configuration of the streets and also allowing the pigs to roam free and dig up the streets, uh, kept it kind of safeguarded. Uh, animals were moving throughout the city, cattle were coming down Broadway to market. Um, the pigs really did something and pigs became conflated with the humans. Um, in 1816, the question is, uh, if we were able to deal with uh, nuisances with rings in their ears, meaning prostitutes, why can't we deal with nuisances with rings in their noses, meaning the pigs? Um, the people, Dickens, his uh, comment about pigs wondering why that the humans around them were walking on two legs and speaking this strange language instead of grunting like hogs is another uh, look at how humans and pigs became conflated. Um, kind of the living situation um, there's the, the idea of the, the one bad day uh, for animals now uh, in, the, you know, uh, in um, the meat industry. Well, you know, the, the chickens had one bad day. It was their last day. Um, but the pigs and the humans all kind of shared the same kind of days um, in the five point area. So good or bad, um, they were all living a very close, very shared existence. They say that uh, Dickens notes that the pigs would go home to specific houses at the end of the day. They knew who their owners were. They would go out and forage. Uh, with the lack of a strong sanitation system in the city at that point, pigs were considered to be one of the big trash removal systems. 
Um, so there was there was a whole conflation between the the human and the animal, and I think that that's why five points became important was because uh, that was the pigs became the symbol of revolution because they were a daily thing, but they were also something that moved out throughout the city. They weren't just kept in that area. You could find them all over Broadway, everywhere. So they were kind of like a spreading uh, message of, of this one, you know, leave us alone. Um, Dickens did a tour of Five Points. He was accompanied by police officers. Uh, it was after he left that Five Points kind of lost its edge in terms of being a gritty part of the city. Um, people would go look at, it was the origin of the slum tours, um, begins in kind of the uh, 19th century where people were accompanied in to see the bars, the nightlife, the, the, the kind of dirty side of underbelly of the city. Um, and then Five Points becomes kind of a parody of itself and, and disappears. And the pigs are just pushed further and further north out of the city. Uh, thousands of them until uh, they too disappear. They become, uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's really sure. interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a question uh, from Jack. Do you want to unmute and um, yeah, ask a question? Um, I think Michael might have had his hand up longer than me. No worries. I'll go oh, Okay. Later. <laughs> Okay, then, you, I, then I'll ask the question. I, I just said that Jack can go first, but whatever. Uh, I first wanted to thank uh, Brian for the for the examples that he brought up towards the end of his presentation, because you know I started thinking of, of all sorts of examples that sort of fall into the same pattern, starting with you know there's an episode of a Lone Ranger where Tonto goes around the mine with a dead crow and stuff like that. So I just wanted to thank you for that. There was like a little my movie go, going in front of me. Um, my question is actually to to Philip. Um, um, uh, related related to that notion of the raccoon as a colonial agent, uh, in particular, you know, when you think of the uh, 20th century in particular, when the raccoon was then actually consciously um, um, imported in a certain way to Europe in particular, Germany, uh, but I think also uh, in Scandinavia and other, other parts of Europe. Um, and of course, as an invasive species, it's wreaking havoc to, the, havoc to the environment and basically spreading uncontrollably. So I was wondering whether uh, you actually touch on that in your, in your project and you know, whether that would still be you know, some sort of non-human agency according to your definition, because at the end of the day, it's still dependent on you know, humans acting first, et cetera. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I can say I, I won't be looking at that, but only because it doesn't fall into my my focus is early America, so I stop looking with uh, with the end of the Civil War, and that's already very late for early American um, stuff. But it's still interesting. I think it's interesting also um, considering you know the the idea of invade invasion. Uh, not necessarily as as non human agency, but the notion of the raccoon as this invasive. Um, this invasive animal that's also always portrayed as a thief and it's always kind of tricking people and I mean in indigenous mythology the raccoon's also a trickster so it's uh, this I don't know I think that's interesting also also in America the raccoon becomes a very racialized symbol in the in the 20th century and uh, uh, in its short form it's it's a racial slur and um, I think so uh, Daniel Heath Justice who I used a lot in in my looking into the the raccoon he he goes into a lot of the the more recent history also in his I think 2021 he, he published a book that's called raccoon and it's all about raccoon history and yeah so that's don't think I can say more about that though so thank you no worries thanks thanks um John, do you want to go ahead with a question yes thank you um thanks everybody for great presentations uh, so I have a question that is directed at Brian and Todd, um, and I'm interested in the quality of the sounds of the animals that you're that you're talking about. So the the squealing of the pigs, but then also the singing of the canaries. And I'm kind of wondering how the quality of the sounds that these animals produce maybe affect 
what people hear in those sounds or what those animals are able to tell us? What kind of effect does that quality have on what we think these, or what these people have believed um, that these animals can express to us? Well, I'll try first. Um, that's a great question, thanks. Um, so, I mean, you know, one thing I would say is in terms of their actual use in the mines, um, when, when you read things like the US Bureau of Mines reports as they're kind of discussing the uh, sounds that canaries made, um, the, the fact that they're cheerful, loud, fairly constant and consistent is, um, is, is essentially what, what makes them good as, as kind of mine detection um, technologies. Right, the, the, the fact that they're, um, in fact, I think that's one reason why they get favored over many other small birds that could have been used instead, was that they seem to be, um, again, I, the, the word that comes up over and over again is cheerful, um, which I think is interesting in terms of the way that they describe the sound. Um, I, you know, it's funny, in the, in the movies that I've uh, watched in particular, um, the birds make less sound. I mean, you get just kind of like fluttering um, a few kind of tweets and chirps, right? It's obvious that they're disturbed by whatever forces uh, are, are endangering them, but you actually don't get much um, true kind of um, chirping either, you know, before or after um, uh, these, these, you know, that they're very, they're actually rather quiet, um, which I find kind of surprising. So, which I think actually limits their, their um, use. And in fact, I think if we heard them more often, you'd probably think about the bird more often than just, oh, it's only a, a kind of a technology for, for detecting danger. Um, and, and as the, the canaries are, are quiet, um, the pigs are loud. Uh, they are heard all over their squeals uh, of fear. Um, there are shows that are performed where um, ventri ventriloquists also perform animal sounds. And one of the sounds uh, in 1841 at the Bowery was the squeal of a pig uh, being killed. Uh, pigs are, they grunt contentedly, they squeal loudly. Um, they become uh, in that, um, in their preparations for uh, the July 4th uh, commemorations. Uh, they write uh, of the pigs that were put into the hog cart, some grunted, some squealed, some squeaked, and altogether they produced such exquisite harmony as was never before heard of even in Arcadia itself. Willis Kent's bugle is a cornstalk to it. Uh, and Kent having uh, a bugle that had multiple keys, it was a keyed bugle. Um, so it could play uh, more than just the, what you think of the, the kind of the, the taps, the three notes. Um, so there was a wide range of sound that was being produced by these animals. Um, and they were very, very uh, uninhibited in their, in their vocalizations. It was something that, um, and even today, uh, so early childhood development is linked to the concepts of recognizing animal sounds and linking an animal sound to a picture of an animal. It's, it's considered to be a stage and a step in the early development of, uh, of childhood speaking and of childhood um, recognition uh, beyond themselves. Uh, so animal sounds are important in that sense. And, and the sound of a pig, even if we're not, um, we we can hear in our head if we say a pig squealing. We can, you know, it's something that's part of our uh, our knowledge, uh, whether that's an ancient uh, leftover. But we we do have these knowledges, uh, regardless of how far into the city we live, of these other sounds. And so pigs were very much um, known because uh, uh, there was a Frenchman or supposed Frenchman who wrote uh, an editorial to the New York Evening Post talking about all the sounds of the city, the bells, they were gonna put him in the madhouse. You know, it, it was driving him, uh, but the pigs are mentioned, the street callers, it was part of the daily fabric of life. We were always at this point surrounded by animal lives and the animal sounds that they went with. Um, 
Philip, do you had your hand up earlier? Did you still want to ask a question? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so, so first of all, thanks also for your talks. I thought they were great um, and super interesting. Um, I, of course, I'm thinking about animal agency. I'm thinking about um, what what do animals mean, you know, in the context. So, this my questions for Todd specifically. Um, because you mentioned a couple of times the conflation of pigs and the people living in the five points and that the pigs, uh, you mentioned just a minute ago that the pigs were kind of like a kind of workforce that, that uh, disposed of uh, garbage. And um, so now I'm wondering if the pigs at this time, um, so not after the fact, but at this time, were they ever conflated also with, um, I guess, narratives or discussions of class? Because the the workforce, you know, disposing of the garbage in the five points, being the pigs and the pigs being so close with humans and almost living these these human like lives, is this a metaphor that ever surfaced at this time? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it it does, um, and I, I I think of uh, it happens there, but it it also happens um, between pigs and humans. Um, in any city, uh, there was um, Oscar Jensen just wrote a book called Vagabonds, where he looks at um, the lower class, and uh, he begins the book uh, actually with the conflation of a man who owns pigs and the pigs themselves. Um, how do we uh, how do we separate that? We uh, as, as I've mentioned, uh, Dickens talking about he, he not only uses pigs as a symbol. Um, for the republicanism or the uh, clubbish, you know, swaggering gentlemen walking down the streets as the pigs kind of sashay down Broadway. But he also uh, goes specifically to the sound. Why, why do the pigs wonder why the humans are talking the way they talk? Um, and so it becomes very much linked to class, to society, uh, and which is why I think everybody got pigs that once they were Band was because this was their form of revolution. This was their voice in the city. Um, once you had 1821 and the disenfranchisement of the poor and the African American vote, the only way you could make a sound, the only way you could make an impact was through these outlawed animals. And there was nothing they could do about them to, to get rid of them. So I hope that answers. Got about five minutes left. Um, I might yeah, just go with my question if that's all right. Um, so my question is for Brian. Um, so what stayed with me, um, well, among other things, um, with your presentation, with this question at the end of how we move beyond the metaphor of the canary as you know metaphor for catastrophe in order to give agency to, um, to the bird. Um, I just wonder whether would you suggest that once kind of the Child's or the understanding of animals become part of the popular imagination, it then becomes kind of normalized and therefore the kind of popular culture then fail to perhaps move or change or make any impact, meaningful impact on you know the ways in which we view animals um, in the context of climate change. I mean, I think you're right. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, your your question is my answer, probably. I, you know, I think, um, yeah, especially um, we we now because it's it's such a, a long-standing, maybe even now overused metaphor. Um, the the canary itself just becomes kind of always um, used as that as that metaphor. In fact, I just read an article, um, you know, yesterday after I finished this presentation that was um, discussing um, birds as canaries in the coal mine of, of climate change, uh, just birds in general, right? because I, I know like bird species, I think have, been, have declined across the world for all sorts of varieties of reasons, including our, our many um, uh, cats wandering uh, neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, that's one reason I think why why um, wh you know why why we get terms like climate canaries and things like that where um, we don't even have to mention the mine anymore. Like I, I think it's just one. It's it, you know the immediate saying of canary. I mean, unless someone's talking about singing like a canary, which is a totally different thing. Um, 
that's that's like I think people's immediate go-to image, right? That um, and I think that's one reason why it just is uh, uh, always with us as as kind of that that metaphor. Um, and you're right. I mean, it it, ha it immediately has usage because of that, right? Even though I think, as I was kind of pointing out, it, it also kind of robs the the birds themselves of of being birds. Um, uh, in that same sense, right? We don't think of them as, as even, even, even as pets um, in some ways, just because of that, um, at least most of us don't. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a really great answer to your question, but I think you're right um, about um, what's happened with, with that kind of metaphor. Thank you. Um, we've got three minutes left. Um, so I'm, I might um, yeah, ask this question to close um, the panel, which is a great panel so far. Um, so uh, yeah, just kind of reflecting on the title of the panel being, you know, the representation of um, non-human agency. And this idea of agency is always about you know, the power, the ability to action and all that. And yet, you know, in your presentations, I think the, 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 the kind of the connecting point is how these animals actually lack agency they don't actually have the power to portray or to you know um yeah portray their agency or present it um so just maybe some, a few words on how do you kind of connect your presentation to um the title of the panel um and just a reflection on the conference as a, you know in general And this is for all of us. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that um, connecting uh, animals to agency and to, and to um, popular culture, the representations of popular culture, you have Dickens um, looking at the animals, you have the uh, newspapers uh, covering the stories intensely. Um, but animal agency, the pigs weren't, uh, the pigs were free roaming. Uh, their lives were their own, much like their owners, um, whether we, uh, think of their lives as being uh, poorly lived because they were in poor circumstances as the social reformers did. Uh, or if you think of, you know, kind of like wonderful lives, they, they, but they spread out to the city. They weren't enclosed in any, uh, in any way, which was the problem, which was why the laws were enacted. Uh, so their agency, it, it took them wherever they wanted to go, um, much to the chagrin of the city and trying to present this image of forward moving in, in a major metropolis. So the pigs were very much agents of their own lives. Thank you. Brian, Philip, do you, want, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I can, I can jump in. I mean, it, you know, I think in my case, you know, the, the bird, the canary is, is a tool and hence it, you know, it lacks agency. And I mean, a tool in the sense it's either a technology for detection in a lot of these cases, or, or it's a tool in the sense that it's a metaphor, right? That it's kind of used for our own political purposes. So I think, yeah, in some ways, because it's always a tool in these situations, it, it is indeed about lacking agency. Yeah, and if if I if I can add something to this still, um, I I think so. If I'm thinking about my own notion of agency, it's always kind of more along the lines of how uh, uh, Bruno Latour would would talk about agency in that it's more of a network of agents and how. Uh, so it's not something that one being or one thing or object in in quotes has inherently has, but it always depends on the context. And I think sometimes the text that we look at or the the representations of animals can ascribe agency to the animals, but I think depending on the perspective, the animals can also exert agency from within these representations. So I think it depends on on how we how we look at the representations and Absolutely. Our understanding of agency. Also. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you did end the uh, the panel on a really positive and you know more enlivening note there. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, once again, thank you so much for all our speakers. Um, yeah, for your brilliant presentations and also for the audience for your uh, very interesting, um, insightful uh, questions as well. Um, and yeah, that, that's it for today's panel. And I hope you come back um, for later and then tomorrow as well um, for further uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Quite early in Australia. <laughs> okay. All right. So hello. Uh, it's a pleasure to be 
to be presenting a server head with you today. Uh, this paper emerged during my PhD, but it happened to fall outside of the scope of my thesis, which investigates human build architecture for birds. So it's uh, great to have a chance to present it here. Uh, first, I'll introduce the common uses of white storks today, which have come to dominate the cultural uses of storks in North America and other countries. And then I'll introduce bas reliefs from the Campana collection that were made in the first century in Italy. These bas reliefs are Nihilithic scenes, depictions of the Nile River. European and African folklore came to the Americas with settlers and colonists, and storks that are native to the southern coast of the US, for example, are not included in American stork iconography. Storks are commonly used in connection to human babies. In 2016, the 3D animated film Storks, produced by Warner Animation Group and Warner Brother Pictures, storks continue in this role. And although in the animation, it is ambiguous as to where the storks live, in this film, they manufacture human babies and they ship them around the world. Depictions of white storks carrying bundles of babies are commonly seen at baby showers, in baby announcements, or in cards that offer congratulations. Today, Hallmark Cards, a privately owned family business in the United States, continues to produce cards with white storks. White storks roosting overhead also have a long history in Europe and areas like Western France, Germany, Poland, amongst many other nations. Storks have long been in folklore, taking on roles as protectors, advisors, and foretellers of the seasons across Europe, Africa, and Asia. But these relationships in the public imagination are primarily the white stork, and they rarely include any of the other 18 species of storks. There are 19 species of storks uh, worldwide. In North America, the only stork is the wood stork, a bird that also migrates with the seasons. The migratory range of both species share similarities. They nest in more northern re regions, and they spend time in warm, warmer, more mild climates during the winter. Uh, these maps are from uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, just to give a snapshot uh, of the variations of these two different species' um, natural ranges. And uh, the white storks, with the exception of zoo exhibits, they do not reside um, in the Americas at all. Wood storks are uh, also social, and they're deeply involved with rearing their chicks, which is similar to the common uh, way we perceive white storks, yet the wood stork um, are not associated with those same roles on the others as the white stork is on the other side of the Atlantic. It is likely that white storks have been in close proximity to human built structures, uh, especially when nesting for a long time, and this can be gleaned from some antiquated uh, depictions. This paper investigates several terracotta bas reliefs from the sculpture, uh, a form of sculpture that's found in architectural detailing uh, from the Campana collection. And these bas reliefs interestingly depict the same scene, and they're named after the 19th century art collector Gian Pietro Campana, whose fastidious cataloging and collecting preserved thousands of works from antiquity. The art historian John Moffat wrote that the common practice uh, of ancient Romans copying mosaics and how the uh, Neolithic mosaic scenes were commonly divided in the foreground as modern and pre-civilized in the background. The bas reliefs here are near copies of each other. And I included four examples uh, from three different museum collections, uh, but I'll focus on the one from the Vatican Museum for the remainder of this talk, which is this one. Okay. So as just mentioned, the scenes foreground the contemporary architecture of the first century uh, with these two arches. And in the background, they contain the major elements of the Nile, as if you're looking from Italy into the Nile Valley. And within each of these arches, there's an addi ad additional depth of field. The foreground is below the water line, and there are hippos eating aquatic plants with large lotus leaves and crocodiles. The midground contains what is floating. So there are figures including humans, ducks, and boats. And the boats are swan shaped and have uh, swan faces. The background, which starts at the shoreline, uh, contains these traditional housing. And if we uh, look at the right here, this one is clearly a more uh, round structure when it has the storks nesting on the roof. 
And then on the left, we have the rectilinear building. And this one doesn't have nests on it at the moment, but storks standing and displaying. Egyptian and Neolithic iconography were popular in ancient Italian ornamentation. But whilst they can't stand for evidence that storks raised their families in ancient Rome, we are shown that storks are included in a cultural narrative. This division is also found in the Campana bas reliefs, where the modern stone arches foreground the mud huts and thatched backgrounds. The variation in the buildings may represent a division of the upper and lower Egypt, where the water represents a seasonal flooding of the Nile, which symbolically ties these two regions together. Art historian Simon Shama published The Embarrassment of Riches in 1987, and in this book, uh, he's talking about Dutch cultural art uh, and through various forms of art. But Shama presents the methodology on how to read art as historical evidence. He warns of the dangers of reading art as a political critic from the mid-19th century did, as a literal record of the here and now of E. Vivante. Shama instructs that art is rarely a literal recording of social experience. It is a document of beliefs, which actually the previous talks we saw kind of reinforce that. Uh, storks in the bas-relief are suggestive um, or even fictions. Patrons, artists, societies, governments, they all have a stake in the art and shift its application. And this adds complexity to understanding uh, the bas-reliefs. Though no matter if they depict allegory or fable, there's clearly an awareness that there are storks that are standing or nesting on roofs. Archaeologist uh, Caitlin Barrett reveals how Neolithic scenes have been understood by scholars as figures engaged in seemingly bizarre behaviors, such as doing battle with hippopotami and crocodiles or engaging in public sexual activity. Because of this understanding, many scholars perceive the scene's primary function as a comical exoticizing or othering and mocking of the Egyptians. However, Barrett clarifies that most depictions actually recall ancient themes from Egypt, uh, from Egyptian religion, such, such as the battle with the hippopotamus that alludes to the struggle um, to get order over chaotic forces that the hippopotamus represents. Barrett goes on to explain how the imagery from the Nile are connected to this, these religious beliefs and returning to the wandering goddess and their connection to the land. So with the change in the Nile, the, the flooding of the Nile. Barrett doesn't explicitly uh, comment on storks. And I suggest that the storks and the bas-reliefs are closely aligned with vernacular Egyptian architecture, moving to roost and building on human built structures. In bygone ages, the arrival of storks would inform people when to plant or harvest different crops. Storks were tied to seasonal changes that humans came to depend on, and their presence on these vernacular buildings paired with the flooding of the Nile may represent a seasonal shift. The arrival of spring, and spring to this day is connected to fertility and rebirth, which may be represented with eggs, chicks, ducklings, bunnies, as we saw with the turkeys we were just talking about. Um, and in Europe, spring also coincides with the sudden appearance of large numbers of nesting storks. And this connects storks with two children, babies, and youth. Storks in allegories and literature and fable are commonly associated with children. The children's story, The Storks, by Hans Christian Andersen, is an example that connects children to more lessons through observing natural behaviors of white storks. Andersen describes the storks on houses in a very similar manner to how they nest in Europe today. Andersen's story allows for humans to imagine themselves as a stork, how frogs and little snakes could be to storks as lollies are for human children. The moral lesson of the storks by Anderson encourages children to respect storks. And there's a dark consequence for not being respectful. The storks will deliver a dead baby to naughty children, whereas kind children will receive a brother or a sister from the stork. It is difficult to imagine placing this extreme responsibility on children today, but this connection between children and birth myths, myths continues to be entangled with, with storks. When reading accounts of animals in historic texts, both autobiographical and fictional, we can't assume to fully understand how the author or artist saw animals. Animal historian Erica Fudge makes this point with her analysis on the account of the Italian merchant's son, Alessandro Magno, written in 1562. 
Magno witnessed an affair in the Bear Garden in London in which a monkey is mounted on a horse's back and baited by dogs. He enjoyed the monkey's cry. However, he found the bear ba uh, baiting to be unpleasant to watch. So it's a reminder that today's readers, we have to be ever cautious not to make ill-informed assumptions. Similarly, when Anderson wrote the Storks, we can't assume we know exactly how, what that meant to the 19th century author. But we can infer that real material events shaped Anderson's understanding. Storks were overhead and they were on rooftops. The proximity that storks have to humans is an echo from a shared history between humans and storks that has given the white stork a strong connection to fertility, rebirth, and spring. Storks have culturally and physically uh, physical closeness to humans. People come to know stork families on their roofs. And some, like the recent Croatian story of Kaleptin and Milena, illustrated uh, close bonds between humans and white storks. The colonization of the Americas by foreigners brought various folklores and myths associated with storks from their home countries. And this is why we see uh, the white stork dominating the baby delivery myths and ideas around fertility. Yet through this time, the wood storks have never gained the same reputation in the Americas. Curiously, wood storks are unlike white storks in a major way. They do not nest on human built houses or structures. Wood storks nesting success is dependent on their secrecy and distance from humans. In Brazil, they found that ecotourism sites, uh, wood storks have less success than at undisturbed sites. Architecture plays a role in shaping the interactions with birds. The intimacies that white storks have with humans is influenced by their presence to, uh, I mean, sorry, by their preference to build close to and on top of human built structures. The American popular imagination looks towards white storks and continues to use them in fables because they are storks overhead connected to human architecture even when at a distance. All right, I think I spoke really quickly because that's the end. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you.